Uh, welcome to today's community conversation, the Dynamo Office Hours, evaluation using generative design tools. We've got Saul, Jacob, and special guest, Lily Smith. Um, my name is Sean Hurley. I'm the Autodesk community host. Uh, community conversations are virtual meetups featuring speakers from across the community. The sessions range from deep dives, tips and tricks, live demonstrations, products such as AutoCAD, Revit, Dynamo in this case, uh, emerging trends, career, industry, all kinds of things. And you can lead one of these as well. Um, if you go to the community conversations page, there's a link to get started and get involved and you're able to join. Um, Next, our fun one, which I am going to get a shirt printed in this so I can wear it everywhere I talk. <laughs> this, this is our safe harbor statement. This just is saying that if you make any purchasing decisions, um, that you make them on the way that uh, in the state the product is today in shipping form. You know, So if we make any forward discussions, we can't make any promises about the future operations or features of the products and technologies. But anyway, lawyers like us to say that just so we don't make any promises and you hold us to them. So make your decisions based on the products as they are today. The lines are muted to reduce the background noise, although we do invite you to turn on your camera. Um, kind of gives us that in-person kind of feeling. Um, a little quieter in this room, uh, Jacob, than it was at AU. Quite a bit. <laughs> um, uh, you know, to ask a question in the, the bottom right, there's a little hand. You can raise your hand and we'll call on you to unmute, or you can ask in the chat. There is, the, ses the session will be recorded and we'll post the link on the uh, event page where you registered, as well as uh, we will put it into the playlist, the YouTube playlist, and I'll give a link to that later on. So, all right. And it is a conversation, so feel free to jump in if you have something relevant to what's being talked about or hold it for the Q&A section. My name is Sean Hurley. I'm Autodesk Community Engagement Manager. I am a geeky technologist in Bend, Oregon. And my name is Jacob Small. I'm an Autodesk uh, technical consultant uh, focusing on generative design in uh, Dynamo. Uh, I've described myself as a Dynamo form junkie. I'm on there way too late solving stuff like how do I get custom IFC export settings that have been saved was my task last night. But yeah, you can find me on there all the time based out of Boston, Mass. Hello, everyone. My name is Sol. I'm a product manager working on Dynamo. Uh, I describe myself as a curious human being, also based out of Boston currently, but originally from New Zealand. Hi, everyone. Lily Smith. Um, thank you guys for having me back. It's great to be here and talk to you all. I'm a product manager also uh, in Boston in the computational design and automation group, and I am an architect geek in many ways. All right, so, welcome everyone. Oh, oh, after you, you saw, it oh, it's all you. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the Dynamo Office Hours series. Uh, this is session 36. Uh, we have 35 other hours of awesome content should you want to go and check it out. I know Sean's just posted the playlist uh, for you there. Today, uh, Lily's going to talk us through, and Jacob, they're going to talk us through evaluation using generative design tools. And the agenda is the same as always. If you've come before, we're gonna have roughly a 20 minute presentation uh, on the evaluation uh, using generative design tools, as well as a bit of a live demonstration. Uh, cue the danger mu uh, music, it is live. Things may go wrong and Q&A, we do encourage to happen all the way through the session if you have a question, uh, but you can also ask at the end if you wish to wait. All right, so since this is a continuation um, of what we did before, I thought it was important that we start by talking about what we did last time in Dynamo Office Hours. Uh, so Lily uh, previously presented this uh, problem where we want to design an office building uh, in uh, Boston uh, to sort of maximize uh, open space and uh, views uh, to make sure that uh, you know, we're also getting the maximum amount of rentable space and minimizing the facade area because it winds up that it's expensive to build those nice uh, glass walls. So she built the dynamo graph that does something along this and it would get a few different eight options actually uh, to be able to sort of vary how the tower uh, winds up getting uh, constructed. Um, and, you know, a modification to let's say the height on of tower one is going to modify the overall massing, uh, the center point uh, U, the center point V is going to modify the massing and so on and so forth to get different results. 
Um, and then she walked through kind of how we'll evaluate that. So we looked at max maximizing the open uh, space, uh, minima uh, maximizing the floor area, minimizing the facade area, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so with that graph and the different parts of it sort of set up, uh, we, we looked at, you know, what would it be to do kind of large uh, cross product studies? We're looking at 6,561 designs if you just had three options for each of those eight different variables, uh, which is a really big number. So how can we sort of explore that massive a design space? And that's even just a small section thereof, because that's only three samples per piece. Um, and that's really what we're going to start to get in today. So uh, the previous session sort of covered the people portion before, where we're sort of looking at describing our, our constraints and goals and setting up our concept and building this initial uh, parametric model in Dynamo that will allow us to explore the, uh, the space. Uh, today, it's all about sort of partnering with the machine uh, to let generative design do the iterations on your behalf. Uh, and then moving into um, sort of evaluating the outcomes, uh, curating what it is that you're after, uh, and pull out the detail that you want so that you can make a more informed decision. On, with that said, uh, Lily, I think we're going to uh, hand over to you for the share. So I'm going to go ahead and hit stop share so you can pick up. Great. Let me just get my screen. Great. So yeah, thanks again um, for having me back because this really is the critical second half of this problem, right? So we set up a parametric model. We developed some ways to um, measure it. Um, but today I'm going to talk about how to use the computer to help generate all these um, options, the me different methods we have, and how to evaluate them so that we can sort through our 6,561 designs and try to make some decisions. Um, and then we'll also talk about what we can do with those decisions um, and the all the data that we're generating um, once we once we make it. So you know we really we want to do this so that we can do things like um, compare the designs objectively, compare them on the same measurements, compare apples to apples. Um, we want to evaluate them on maybe non-intuitive measures uh, and really to leverage exploring more designs than we, we could if we were doing this by hand. Um, so uh, I think we talked about this a little bit last time, but just to reiterate that there are different types of measurement we can think about when we're when we're looking at measuring these designs. Um, we can do some pretty simple calculations. There are single nodes that will give us uh, evaluations, uh, such as uh, surface area. Um, or we can use a little bit more complex tools. We have uh, in our refinery toolkit, we have some tools for measuring things like uh, doing a view analysis um, that can help you uh, you know, get started with some of this analysis a little bit um, more easy. Uh, and then, of course, there's always going to be things that are maybe unmeasurable around um, aesthetics uh, and, and personal preference. Um, and as much as we can make those mathematical equations, maybe subjective mathematical equations, we can, we can still look at these issues and we'll look at an example um, of that as well. Um, so this is just looking at the, um, again, the um, how we're doing some of the view analysis from the, with the refinery toolkit, um, looking at this um, view distance node, um, that's a part of this toolkit. Uh, you could use it to make a grid on your building and then measure points out of it. Um, uh, and then um, this is our methodology for um, looking at something that may be an aesthetic consideration, but how we're going to kind of turn this into a mathematical equation. So we had a notion that uh, we thought our building looked better. You remember it has the three, um, three masses, three forms. And we thought um, subjectively that it looks better if it has more differentiation between the height of the towers. So we developed a way to measure that. 
saying, let's take in all of these heights. So height one, height two, height three, for all the different designs, we can average them and then take the difference from each of these, uh, each of the heights to the average point and give that, use that as a score. And I'm gonna actually show you um, how, to, how to do this in Dynamo. Um, it's, it's not very difficult math, but it's a, it's a nice example of kind of how to make some of these aesthetic subjective decisions into math. You can, you can agree with my, uh, with my method or, or I would love to hear different ideas on, on how we could do this too. Um, a reminder that uh, these are our very important evaluation metrics um, that we'll see uh, in the graph. Uh, and let's see. So, okay, so now I'm going to talk about kind of this middle part. And I'm going to go over some of the concepts of the method that we're using, that these generative design tools are using uh, to run all of these options. So we're just going to, um, I'm going to show you some of the, of the methods, explain the basics behind them, and then we'll go and look at them in, in the software. Um, so, okay, these are the um, four different methods that we currently have. Randomize, like this, space evenly, and optimize. And let's, let's look at them in a little more depth. So the first one is called uh, randomize. And this basically just assigns random values to each of your inputs. And it can be a really good test for your logic because you can say, oh, let me just test if this, if my design system is working, I can see, I can quickly run just 10 options, get a sense of, of how it's, how it's uh, working. Um, it can also be useful if you don't know yet what you wanna optimize for and you wanna, um, you wanna look at your design space um, and then make some decisions on what you wanna, what you wanna optimize for. Um, space evenly, so you'll notice like if I go back, like random is understandably random and space evenly is using a more even distribution of values over the, um, over the inputs that you have decided to vary. Um, so this can also be a good test of the generative graph logic, and it can also be really useful for testing the boundaries. So these, um, these inputs are all um, defined by the range that is set for them, which is you know, critical in your exploration. And so if you want to test um, the ranges at each of the ends, this can be a really good uh, method to use. Um, the next one is called like this, and this method um, uses the values that are assigned as defaults, um, but it just explores close to those values. So if you want to, it's within 20% plus or minus of the starting value. Um, and it doesn't, it won't go outside the range that you've, that you've set in that input. Um, but this can be good for tweaking a design and to see how a small um, change can affect, uh, affect your study. Then the final um, method that we have, there are many more methods that you could use to do this. These are just the ones that we, we have implemented um, so far. Um, but the, this uh, method is called optimize and it actually uses a much more sophisticated algorithm behind the scenes than the other three methods. This uses um, a open source algorithm called NSGA2, um, which uh, is an optimization algorithm, which is used in many other, um, any other, many other pursuits and industries. Um, but we used it here because it's a good method for multivariable optimization. So it takes into account more than one goal and has a method for um, for evaluating generations of options that you run and trying to improve the results based on the goals that you set after each generation. 
So I'm not going to explain exactly how the algorithm works because that can be a college course. Um, and but it is um, it's it's great to have um, this algorithm kind of backing this this method, and we've tried to make um, settings that are understandable and accessible in order to in order to use this. Uh, okay, so the last part um, is being able to take the options that have been run through one of these methods and being able to evaluate them, to curate them, and to make some choices uh, on on what your uh, what your best design is. Um, so there are many ways to do this. This is the uh, explore outcomes interface that we have. Um, and you know one of the uh, one way that you can do this is simply by choosing a uh, one of the uh, one of the metrics uh, for evaluation. In this case, we're looking at floor area and just toggling the list um, as you would do in Excel or in any kind of um, uh, any kind of uh, ranked list, you can just toggle the ascending or descending values so that you can see, okay, which are the designs that have the most floor area? If all I care is about floor area, I can see which ones um, have the most floor area. And you can, obviously you can sort it on other, you can change this to the facade area and toggle it the other way saying, okay, which ones have the least facade area? So that's kind of the first way that you could come in and you can look at your, look at your results. Um, we also have a chart down here called parallel coordinates, um, which is basically a roll up of all of the options um, that have been produced by one of your one of in one of your studies. And we have ways that I'll show you in the software to um, to filter through these and um, choose the uh, values and the ranges of the values that you want to look at, which will then filter down your results to just to just show you th those as well. Um, one of the other graphing options that we have is the scatter plot. And this one uh, is a method where you can you can start to sort um, four different, there are four different dimensions that you could look at at once here. So there's an x axis, a, or y axis, x axis, and then you can also set the, um, the size of the dot and the color of these dots um, based on different values. So those are how the four dimensions um, work. And we'll see, and you can also filter. Uh, filter the results this way. We'll see why the um, scatter plot can be really useful, especially um, when looking at optimization runs. Um, so I wanted to explain a little bit about a concept in uh, in optimization that has to do with uh, which are the best options uh, for when you have multiple variables. Um, so this is an example um, problem, which is kind of similar to our building problem, actually, in that it looks at um, surface area and volume. Um, but the way that this model is set up, it's a little bit of a different logic. It's looking at these three different radiuses here. Um, and if you set those radiuses in diff to different sizes, um, the resulting form will have a different volume and surface area that you're measuring, right? Um, so intuition tells us that the sphere would give us the most efficient trade-off in these goals. Um, but there's no real design which has both the smallest surface area and the largest volume. So plotting the design relative to the two goals, as we see here with volume on the y-axis and surface area on the x-axis, 
um, shows the trade-off between them, which is really a line of designs that moves from the lower left corner to the upper right. Um, in this case, the trade-off is fairly simple and close to linear, um, as designs with more volume tend to have greater surface area. The designs along this line can also be considered optimal, um, since for each one there is uh, no other design which beats it in both goals. So for example, these designs 126 and 137 can both be considered optimal, while design five, this one here, is not because there are many designs that both have more volume and less surface area. So the line in optimization is something that they call the Pareto optimal front. And it has to do, it refers to Pareto efficiency in economics. Um, but this optimal front is a kind of boundary that divides the space in terms of its goals. So it's it's helpful to look at um, at you know this this line as where the best options are. Um, and so all of the designs that are occurring on the boundary are optimal because it's really impossible to make any of them better in one goal without making it worse in at least one other goal. So as you move along the boundary, you'll find other designs that are equally optimal, but solve the trade-offs in other ways. Any designs found inside the de boundary are feasible, but non-optimal, since you can easily find designs which perform better in all goals by simply moving closer to the boundary. So one thing that, um... Well, first I wanted to say, I really like that we're using kind of a bell shape to illustrate something other than a bell curve uh, in a chart. But uh, after that, one one other thing that's really important to keep in mind as we um, look over this stuff is that it's possible to have actually multiple Pareto fronts depending on which uh, metrics you're looking at exploring, right? Because in this graph here, Lily, we've only got two metrics that we're uh, displaying, but in your sample graph, we've got, I think there were five different metrics. So we could have one Pareto front that might look like this and another one that might be more of a, sort of a sine wave even. Um, actually, I don't know that I've seen sine wave necessarily, but um, we, you could have uh, something that looks more parabolic uh, in nature in terms of the overall curve. So um, just something to keep in mind as you're starting to explore this stuff. And generative, the NSGA2 algorithm actually does a great job of sort of exploring all of those Pareto fronts concurrently. Yeah, and I, I like this um, notion of the utopia point, which is the, this, this notion is like, this would be the ultimate design, right? Like if you could have the, um, the absolute most volume, but no surface area. So it's impossible. Like you could never, you could never reach that. But it's um, like all the designs that are like closest to to the utopia point um, are kind of the best ones. So it's just it's a way to it's a way of to evaluate them to to look at them um, when you're looking at optimization. So and then if we look at so these are some this is like kind of a a spoiler to what I'm going to do next. But um, this is our um, three tower solid tower model and looking at you know I did a randomized run of 40 options and this is looking at floor area on this y-axis sod area on the x-axis and looking at it compared to an optimized run where I did population was 100 runs and 10 generations so there were a lot more runs that took place than my 40 random runs. Um, but you can see that they're, they're starting to, you know, here is my utopia point, which is the same as the other, similar to the other example. Um, and, you know, I can start to see like this, this line and all the ones that are closest to this line are kind of the best options. And you can see with optimization and just doing more runs that we, that we get um, more runs that are kind of closer to this, to this optimal, uh, optimal location. Okay, so let's run. Let's go into um, the software, and I am just going to switch over to my other screen here. If I can find Zoom. 
Okay. All right. Can you guys see Revit? Hopefully. Cool. Okay. Um, and just let me just do one more thing. Okay. All right, so this this model is available in the, I think Sean posted it um, from the last um, session. So uh, you're welcome to, to follow along or to um, you know, go into this afterwards, but all the scripts in the model um, should be available. Um, so, okay, so the first, um, we're gonna open our uh, definition here of our three solid tower problem and um, look at look at our graph and how it's uh, how it's working here. So okay, so this is my file open up. Sorry, I should have had this open and ready to go, but I always like to make sure to start from start from scratch right yep okay so i have used lots of collapsed groups in this because i love the collapsed groups and um i think they make it a little bit easier to to find things um but this is our three solid tower um model with all of our inputs in pink and our kind of functions in green and our evaluators in orange uh and a little gray section here about uh sending things to revit um and So uh, just to point out that uh, these um, these metrics that are recording things like open space, it's uh, critical to set those to is output in order to get them to show up um, as metrics and get them to show up as things that you can uh, optimize for. Um, they need to be single numbers in order to participate in the um, as in as a generative design output because uh, you can't maximize or minimize a list and the software will help you uh, help tell you that. So if I have um, if I have my graph properties or my graph status set here to generative design, this has a um, a special function in these extensions that helps um, guide you to make a successful generative design graph. So if I set something that is returning a list here to, um, to be an output, it's going to give me an issue here and tell me that um, that lists don't work in generative design. So, okay, that's, um, and you can see, you know, our evaluator for calculating open space here is very straightforward. We're just taking um, the, the surface and, and subtracting, uh, subtracting the open space from it, uh, and then adding up all of the, um, adding up this, this surface area, uh, and then reporting it as a number that we can watch in generative design. All right, so let's look at um, how we can make one of these uh, evaluators. So I actually brought in as a little <laughs> as a little image here our height differentiation metric, and this could be used to in your graph to explain how this was working to other people, to remind yourself of of the logic of it, just as an image here. Um, and we can we can refer to this um, as we as we build this uh, graph here. But it's just it's just a couple nodes. So I actually have it built in here, but I'm going to I'm going to rebuild it. Um, and so we can we can understand uh, how it works. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do here, as we explained, is um, co collect all of the heights. So I'm just going to make a code block where I oops. Um, 
I'm going to collect height one, height two, height three, close my list. And then I have something that, and I always like to do this so I can, I can tell from the closed groups, you know, what these, what these are. Uh, and I'm just going to fill in from the actual inputs, um, these values. So now I have my heights here. Uh, then the next step is to do an averaging here of all the heights, right? So there's a pretty easy out of the box. Function that I can average a list of, where did that go? Uh, I can list, I can uh, take a list of numbers and get an average of them. You can see uh, if I have, I'm gonna set this to auto so I can see this running. Um, so that's great. I'm getting an average of my numbers. Um, now I need to see what the difference is between this average and all of the different heights. So I'm going to take, um, I'm just going to do a subtraction. And I'll take my average number of each of the heights and subtract it from the heights themselves. And then I'll have this list of difference between what the average is and what each of the heights is. I need to now, you can see I have some uh, negative numbers in there. So I need to change this into absolute values so that I can use them as a, a score. And I'm just going to, once they're all non-negative numbers, I can then sum them up and, and use that as my score. So this is going to be, the sum of this is going to be this orange block here. And then I can have one number as a score that I can make a watch node as, if I can spell watch right. And if I set this to, well, I'm gonna rename it as height score, make it an output, and then it will show up in my um, in my generative design. So I'm actually gonna um, delete this one and just use the one that I, that I already have up here, um, but it's it is the same the same exact procedure here. So OK, so let's look at now that we have uh, all of our outputs set. We have some idea about how we got to those uh, got to those outputs. Um, and we're going to look at um, now how we're going to run this. Uh, any questions yet, Jacob or? Soul that you want to go over? Nothing in the chat. Okay. All right. So when we let's let's save this and we can actually. So I'm running. This is Dynamo in Revit, and I can actually run generative design. So I have generative design tools on the Revit ribbon. I also can access them from Dynamo. There's a couple differences that I'll that I'll talk about. Um, but if we want to create a study, we can just go right from Dynamo here. Um, and we pointed to the folder where this DYN lives. Uh, and we can choose this. And if it's set as a generative design study, it'll show up in this list. Um, and it will be vetted for use in generative design. Um, and then we can go in and we can 
actually name it. So I like to um, name these after the, the methods uh, that we're using to generate these studies. So I'm gonna say that we're gonna do a random 20 and the method is going to be randomized. We tried to provide these, um, these graphics and little descriptions on the, on the methods to remind you what they're, what they're about, um, which I think are pretty helpful. Uh, but um, with randomize, you, and then there's, there's different uh, options that show up when you set to different, um, the different methods, right? Um, so randomize just has whether you want to vary any of these inputs or not. And if you uncheck this, you can um, just set it to a certain value and it won't, it'll just stick to that value and it won't vary the height anymore. But I wanted to, I wanted to vary the height because I'm interested in studying these different height variations. So I'm going to keep that on. Um, and then I can just set the, the number of solutions and I can kick off um, this generation. And once it starts here, so you can see, you know, the, the name here is showing up um, that I set uh, when I was creating the study. Um, I'm just gonna let that generate for a minute and I can actually go back, oh, that's not gonna work. Um, I think after it gets to a couple options, I can, I can go back and I can create another study or I can come in and I can look at the uh, other studies that have already finished. Um, so this is looking at um, a random run that I did a little bit ago, and we can start to see um, how that is, is going, to, going to turn out. So I've actually done a randomized study, and I've also done an optimization study. And uh, we, can, we can look at, uh, start to look at how those compare. Um, we also have the ability to change up here to from thumbnails to also to data. Um, and so that'll list out um, all these different parameters. And you can start to compare pretty easily um, this way by just clicking on either of the columns. So let's let's start first by looking at, uh, at the floor area. And we're just gonna sort this um, by this column to go for, so we said that we wanted to have the most floor areas and we had the most rentable area. So we can see what this um, randomization run gives us in terms of um, the most floor areas. So we can see like the highest values that I got to with just a randomization run are um, 66,716 square feet. So anywhere, you know, from, and then the lowest is 15,000 square feet. Uh, then if we look at the optimization run and compare that, we can see that the most floor area is 72,000 feet. So it's managed to, you know, and part of it is because it's doing many more runs, right? That the probability of it getting um, a better floor area, but it's also, Going from what you told it that you want to um, that you want to maximize and uh, that floor area. So let's come in and we'll just look at um, how you our other run has already finished there, and we can look at um, creating that optimization run. So when you set this to, uh, I I like to put like the number of population and. Uh, and generations that I did. Um, so I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna leave this as the default of a population of 20 for each generation, running 10 generations. Um, and here you'll notice that this is different now. The UI is a little bit different because I, I need to set whether, what I'm gonna optimize for, right? So, I want to, I said I want to optimize my view score to have the best views out. I want to have the least facade area because it's expensive glass facade. I want to have the most floor area because I want to have the most rentable area. 
most open space. And I wanna maximize um, the difference in height that we set up there. Um, so that is going to run um, these, uh, it'll run 20 options to start, and then it'll run again in another generation, trying to pick the best of those, combine them, and do generation after generation to try to get, um, to get better results. Um, so, okay, so this um, optimization is running. Um, but we can look at one that I did um, did previously. And let's just look at how to get to the um, the different uh, graphic uh, analysis that we have, graphing analysis that we have of these results as well. Yeah. One thing to note while this runs its initial calculation is um, the initial optimization. We don't see any results uh, populate until the entire first generation is done. And that counter that we see one out of 10 um, is actually going to tell us what generation it's on. Whereas on the randomization um, and like this studies, it tells you how many uh, actual individual results has it returned as opposed to uh, what generation it's on. Yes. And you can also go in and you can pause it or you can um, throw out those results uh, if you want. Um, so down here is the uh, parallel coordinates and the scatter plot. And so these have um, ways that you can, it actually looks at the, the metrics that the, the goals that you're well, things that you have identified as outputs show up as bold lines here, um, and the inputs uh, show up as non-bold lines. Um, so you can actually go in and you can start to say, okay, I want to look at uh, options with, you know, the most floor area, the least facade area, and you know, I have to make these. Um, overlap a little bit since they do uh, they do correlate. Um, but if we want to have, you know, it can start to like manually select from all these all these options kind of our best um, our best choices for our many our many different well our five different um, goals. And so you know if we start to uh, narrow things down in this way, you know, we can get to where we only have a few options that are really, really the best thing um, for for our goals. Um, then we can also go into uh, the scatter plot, and if we start to look at um, how we're looking at it on the PowerPoint with the with the utopia point and the different, um, I like to make some colors here, but um, we can start to look at, you know, which of these options, how these options, and if I mouse over them up here, they'll, they'll show up um, in my scatter plot chart. And so I can look at, okay, these are getting kind of, you know, these are getting close to that front, they may not be exactly on that front, but we have a lot of different, um, a lot of different things that we're going after here, right? Um, okay, uh, so now that we have these options selected, how, what do we, what can we do with them next? Uh, let's look at how we can drive these back into, into Revit. And the first um, way, so I mentioned that this is Dynamo for Revit. Um, so I'm running, you know, directly from Dynamo. There are these generative design tools. Um, I can actually use. Um, uh, I can select one of these options, and you'll notice down here that I have an option to open this in Dynamo. So this is how you get um, from going from Dynamo for Revit. This is and using the Explore from Dynamo for Revit, this is how you can get uh, these variables set to these uh, 
these values in Dynamo. So I'm just going to open this in Dynamo. Uh, and what it's going to do is um, it's going to close the file that I had. And I am going to save these changes, I think. But it will open a, um, a derivative that it's using kind of in the background to do this generative study um, with those values set. So this kind of takes a minute to to close it and open it back up. Um, but here it is opened with those values that I selected as one of my best options. And if I want to go and put this into Revit as an option, I can also do that. Um, I'll go up to our integrate Revit output. And um, what controls we have, we made this data gate node, which is a method of controlling when things go into Revit or not. So you'll notice that this is closed. And if I open it, it's going to give me a warning here saying that the gates are now open. You might want to not want to do this in generative design because it's going to try to push stuff into Revit every time you run it. Um, but we can, op we can open it for the purpose of putting stuff back in Revit and run it, and it will actually create our building right there in Revit. Um, OK. I'm also going to show you, so that was kind of method one. We can also close out of all of this, and I'm just going to actually delete. Um, the tools from, if we run from the Revit ribbon, um, have a couple more affordances that make this a little bit easier to do from Revit. Uh, so if we go into Explore Outcomes, and we choose one of our uh, one of our options here. We really need a way to like to tag these that we don't have yet. Um, but let's just choose an option here. Um, and you'll notice that now in the Explore Options, we have a Create Revit Elements button. And what this is going to do is actually open that gate, run the graph for you, make the elements in Revit which is just kind of a nice affordance um, for, for doing this like a little bit in a little bit easier way. And I can also um, use in Revit design options to, uh, to put kind of my favorite three options into actual design options in Revit. Um, so in doing that, you know, I've set up a couple options here. I just go to um, select that option select the one I want here, say create Revit elements. And in a minute, if the magic works, it will create a um, my model here in this design option. Still chugging along. <laughs> But I think it works. I tried it right before this. There it is. There okay, cool. Um, and so I can do that, you know, with um, then I can come in and make another option. And do it again. So it's really, you know, behind the scenes doing all the things that I was showing you before with opening the gate and making this in Revit. Um, but it can be nice, uh, a nice way to, you know, make these um, options that you've done a lot of work on evaluating the different data behind them. Um, you know, you can, and, and you could also push more of that data into the Revit model if you wanted to, to record it about these options. But it's a nice way that you can now kind of, you know, switch back and forth between them in, in the Revit context. Um, okay, so the other thing that I wanted to just go over um, right quick, what else can you do with this data um, is that you can actually go and you can 
export the outcomes. So this little menu here will let you export the outcomes. And if you're doing an optimization study, uh, it will give you this option of all generated and discarded outcomes. And what this means is that during the optimization process, it optimizes by saying certain options aren't good enough for your goals. So it discards a certain subset of them. And But sometimes it can be helpful to know what got kicked out of the study in order to say, you know, what, what's better. We don't show that in the UI, but you can export them and get that um, set of data. You can also include all of these thumbnails. Uh, and I'll just show you quickly what that looks like. Um, so here is, um, I exported this. It comes in as a zip, you can just unzip it. Um, but it gives you all of these thumbnails um, that you can use in other contexts. Uh, and it also gives you a CSV file um, that lists the idea, the study type, the various values for the different metrics and for the outputs and the inputs. It also gives you a, um, if you're if you did an optimization run, it'll keep track of what generation it was created in. And it also says if this was an optimal option for your goals for that generation. And so you'll notice that some of them are false, some of them are true. Um, and you can use um, this information in other contexts. And um, John Pearson on, our, on the Dynamo block has read, uh, has written uh, some great blog posts about, about this information and how to use it in Power BI, um, how to really, you know, tell a story with um, with this with this data that you can generate automatically. Um, so I would encourage you to kind of to go check this out if you want to find out more um, details. If you're a I'm, I'm not very good at Power BI, but it's really fun to go in and geek out with uh, all this data that you can can create and make these uh, make these dashboards. And John will tell you how to how to do it. Yeah, some really cool stuff. All right. Well, um, thanks, Lily. That's been great. Uh, we are running a little bit out of time, though. So yes. We're gonna transition to our wrap up. All right. <laughs> All right, so here's my share button, screen two, here we go. All right, Sol. All righty, so uh, ne not next week, uh, in, in two weeks from now, we'll have Parametric Pumpkins uh, with special guest Zach Crohn, who loves him some Dynamo Pumpkins. Please come join us for that one, should be a blast. Uh, and then after that, we'll return to this generative design series where Jacob and I will run through creating a simple generative design uh, scenario from scratch. Uh, so thanks again, Lily, for the presentation today. It's been awesome. Uh, and that would round out the generative design series for now. Little break for Thanksgiving and then the Dynamo Office Hours year in review will probably be held by Jacob and Sean alone because I'll be out on paternity leave. Great reason to not be there. We'll, we'll catch you some slack this time. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Sean. All right. Well, thank you, Lily. That was that was awesome. I I find it really fascinating. I keep getting lost in the the art amongst the uh, design details. You know, the uh, scatter plots, and I mean, it's it's awesome. All all good information. So appreciate that. Um, I just pasted some links on how you can participate in other locations of the community, as well as uh, make sure to sign up for the rest of these series that are the sessions that uh, Sol just mentioned. Uh, and you can you can explore the many different ways to connect in the Autodesk community, you know, the group network, industry focus communities, Twitter, all that good stuff. There's also the Voices blog, which John Pearson is going to be an author now in there. So we'll have him and Dana DeFilippi as uh, Dynamo authors. Um, anyway, so thank you, everybody. Uh, stay, stay in touch, stay connected, and uh, we appreciate your participation and joining us today. And thanks, Saul, Jacob, Avero, uh, Lily. This is good.
thanks a lot, Lily. This was great. And uh, looking forward to seeing everybody in two weeks to do pumpkins. Yeah. <laughs> Pumpkin time. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. 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 Bye.